Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about a story called Mouse of Small Things, which I wrote for my Sci-Fi Weeklies channel about a year ago. The story came about as an audience selected topic. So for those who may not know, I write weekly sci-fi stories usually based on a topic. And I had been pulling these topics almost exclusively from the topics on SFIA, which is Isaac Arthur's Science and Futurism podcast and video channel, which for those of you who don't know and are interested in science, it's an amazing channel, just the best resource ever for a sci-fi writer. Uh, but I got the idea at some point last year to do polls for audience topics and the channel was really small at the time so I didn't know if there would be enough people to vote and I just sort of asked people for suggestions and I think two people came up with suggestions and they were rogue worlds or rogue planets and unusual friendships was the other one so the topic for this story was rogue planets and unusual friendships and I figured, why not just combine those two together and see what happens? And so Mouse happened. And I've been very happy with the result. I'm really proud of this story for a number of different reasons. So we're going to talk about it. What happened when somebody said, hey, do a story on rogue planets and unusual friendships. So to frame this discussion, I thought we would talk about the main plot element in this story, which is power. But before we get to what power is and, and why it matters, I'd also like to frame this conversation with a question from the last craft talk that a very astute listener asked in the comments. And it was, Ro, in your lectures, you talk about the fact that there's only one plot, but you're always talking about a quest narrative and a dilemma narrative and a handoff and a novel, a simple novel, and all that. But that seems like it's more than one plot. And yes, that is true. That is correct. But it's still just the one plot. It's the cue, the suspense cue, plus constraints, plus the resolution. And so what changes to change something from a quest narrative to a dilemma narrative is that initial suspense cue. Like, what is that suspense cue that the reader is interested in, that grabs the reader's attention? Today, what we're going to be talking about a narrative about power, where power is the main plot element that provides the suspense. And if we go back to the first one of these craft talks, we were talking about the stranger coming to town, where the arrival of the stranger sets the narrative in motion. And that becomes the primary driver of that plot structure. But it's still just the plot structure. And what changes once you introduce a different type of uh, magnetic plot element as a suspense cue are the constraints that are going to shape the story. And the constraints will close off possible outcomes on the road to that resolution in the story. And one of the useful ways of looking at stories like this is when you can categorize stories as say a sex story or a power story or a quest story is you can start to look at stories in that same category and understand the sort of similarities and differences between those types of narratives that fall into that same category. So it helps you to start to internalize the sort of beats that a story should have very similar to musically there's like a timing where you know the first verse should happen and the second verse should happen and then there's a bridge and then there's a refrain and then the third verse and then the song is over and people sort of understand and have internalized that those structures and it's very similar with stories and so we're going to talk about this in the next craft talk we'll talk about a love story and how the love story has those particular beats that are common to a sex plot but it's still the same structure of the magnetic plot element as the suspense cue and then the constraints and and what happens is you start to understand what sort of constraints should be there and when on the road to that resolution so today we're talking about power as that initial suspense cue or as the magnetic plot element that sets the story in motion usually in a power story this will manifest as an imbalance a sense that there's something out of the ordinary with the normal, quote unquote, normal way that a power hierarchy should be operating. And that's usually what you'll see in a power narrative, the, the presence of a usurper king or 
a really bad boss, anything along those lines. I should say here, I should reiterate, I think I talked about this in the magnetic plot elements uh, lesson, but the question of what is power with respect to magnetic plot elements is worth discussing here before we get into the actual story itself. Because there are a lot of bad ideas about this, narratively speaking, with respect to like what is power, what constitutes power in a magnetic plot element sense. And I am of the Cersei Lannister school of thought on this. Power is power. And that tautology there doesn't really help all that much except to say maybe perhaps as a reminder, let's focus in on power in terms of physical power, power of the state, I have the authority, you do not. And that may seem very obvious until you read some really bad ideas about this. So one that comes to mind, so I'm not gonna call out this textbook directly, but there was this quote in this textbook, this creative writing textbook, that discussed the idea of what is power and who has power and which characters have power over the other characters. And this passage was so wishy-washy about, you know, this could be power and that could be power and this character has power over the other character. And it even got to the point where the speaker, whoever this speaker was who was quoted in this creative writing textbook was talking about how a person in a wheelchair had power over the people taking care of them. And at that point, that's not to say there aren't human dynamics there, but if we're going to talk about a thing and have it be so broad that everything can be power, then there's no use in even having the word. If everything is power, then nothing is power. And that brings me back to the, the Cersei Lannister school of thought, power is power. We're talking about the relation to the human hierarchy. One person being on the top, other people slotting in underneath in an order. Somebody makes the decision. And who makes the decision is a lot of what human beings fight over. And really, that's what makes this magnetic. We're sort of wired in to pay attention to where we slot in so we know when we should speak and what we should do and who's in charge. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about power. So Mouse, why is Mouse about power? Well, it begins with this government functionary named Paltivi Moran, and he comes from a moon that's outside the main power structure, which at this time is still Athos. Athos still has all the weight. And so the people inside in the interior of the battery systems where the weight of power is, they kind of hold the reins of power. And Paul Tivy does his best to, even though he resents it, he clearly resents it, he does his best to get in on the power structure, to get as high up as he possibly can. So he clearly cares about it. But at the same time, he, he's also on the outside. So he's just sort of doing the best he can. And so in that opening narrative, which comes from an a non-character narrator or what a narratologist would call as an extra diegetic narrator discusses where Paul Tivy's position is on this power hierarchy and why he sort of resents that and that resentment manifesting in the narration is the initial plot cue so the reader would get a sense that there is an imbalance Paul Tivy cares about it and the fact that his moon is outside this power structure or on the fringes of this power structure or subordinate to the interior structure of the galactic hierarchy, it bothers him. So there's your first suspense cue. I think that's the x-axis of our little plot grid, our plot of plot. Okay, so that sets the story in motion. And as the narration is setting the story in motion, Paul Tivy keeps going down and down, and he doesn't know why, and it seems unfair. He runs into one guy, and how many times has this happened in a corporation or in government or whatever it is, where you know you get a new boss and the new boss doesn't like you, and suddenly you're in the basement and your only friend is your swing line stapler, and man, your job, which was tolerable, but barely, is now suddenly intolerable. And that's what happens to Paul Tivy. So he keeps getting worse and worse assignments. And then he gets sent out and finds this rogue planet to go back to our theme. So up until this point, these are your opening constraints that are starting to set the tone for where this story about power might be going. 
Then he finds something totally mysterious. His robots bring him back an AI that seems like it's an android. And the distinction being an AI is intelligent, but this robot model or this android model shouldn't be intelligent, but he is. And it turns into a huge mystery because he's behaving in an irrational manner, which is totally strange for an android. Shouldn't be doing that. He should be behaving according to his programming or its programming. He should be totally unsentient, and he's not. And so Paul Tivy, he goes into Sherlock Holmes mystery mode. And you might look at this as a subplot. And here begins the mystery of why is this robot behaving in such a strange way? And how is he down there in that outpost that shouldn't be there on this totally mysterious planet? But it also should be noted at this point that Paul Tivy, he's the top of the power hierarchy at this point. And the reader gets the sense that this is where he likes to be, or that it seems natural for him to be in charge, ordering around his AI, ordering around the drones, deciding what to do with the planet. And he has this robot named Rabbit, and Rabbit is totally powerless. So you have that power structure that the two of them are stuck in, or at least Rabbit is stuck in, because he's in the lower subordinate position on this hierarchy. And he realizes the only way for him to get what he wants, which is to get back to the planet, is to appeal to the humanity of Paltivi Moran in order to release him back to where he wants to go. Because Paltivi has that power. He has the striker robots and the drones and the authority that comes from being in control of that tiny little army of robots. So Rabbit is stuck there and he begins to explain himself. How did I get here? Why am I here? What am I doing here? Why do I want to go back to the planet? Because that's essentially what he opens with is like, please send me back. Why did you take me from my planet? What are you guys doing here? And then we get into the story of the mouse. So mouse, the existence of mouse kind of has your shades of Algernon, which I don't think I was thinking of explicitly at the time. I think I thought of framing this unusual friendship in the way that it manifests in the story as being the interesting seed of this story, really. And for me, this goes back to thinking about AI and brains for many, many years. I would say a good decade and a half before anyone was really thinking about AI. I was very much into it from the very first time I heard about like Turing machines and thinking processors and sort of the forebears of artificial intelligence and how they were trying to design it. And I got very deep into early AI and the computational theory of mind and the psychologists who were thinking of the brain as a computer. And that was really my first introduction to psychology was like, well, what, what does a brain do? How does it think? How are scientists going to engineer machines to think the way human brains think? And I read a lot about computational theory of mind. And then I read a lot about psychology and the actual human brain and evolutionary psychology and neuroanatomy and sort of all the other different approaches that modern psychology has on thinking about how people think. And I guess part of what's going on in this story, especially with Rabbit's methodology for how he decides to super intelligence himself, was my thinking about where AI is wrong, or at least the reading that I have done about it, and the scientists who are trying to design AIs to create intelligence or human intelligence, or a simulacrum of human intelligence that prioritizes the thinking process, which sounds kind of funny when I put it that way. But really, the thinking that human beings do is really reacting to the environment. The environment does something and the brain reacts to that. And usually what it does is it has an instinct or a pull. And then our confabulation circuitry tells us a story about why we think what we think. We sort of feel something first, and that feeling becomes important later in the story. That's where all that rabbit talk about how he decided to 
to reorient his own processing power to become sentient and feeling. Human thought begins with a feeling about something, an emotion, and then we tell ourselves a story about the emotion and rationalize our way into thinking that we're thinking and not feeling. But usually what we're doing most of the time is feeling and then telling ourselves a story about that feeling. And that's why we think what we think. There is a very, very narrow framework in which human beings think. And we usually need cognitive tools to do this. And we need a lot of time to do this. And we need a lot of help to do this. And we need other people. I mean, basically what we're talking about is the scientific method, right? Like not only do you need a lot of time to think about an experiment and to set up the structure for the experiment and perform the experiment and gather data and results and all that stuff and then put it through peer review. And then at the end of it, it's like, oh, did I have a thought? Is that a rational thought? <laughs> so, but we don't have time for all that in our daily life. And instead what we do is we, our, our bodies have been hardwired to give our brain a feeling about what's going on in our environment. And then we react and then we tell ourselves a story about it and think that we're thinking. And so that's what Rabbit does, or that's what Rabbit programs himself to do for Mouse. And in that process, he has programmed himself to care about one thing in the universe, and it's Mouse. And as he's going along and sort of perfecting Mouse and making him genetically immortal and more intelligent so that he can speak and be a companion, and essentially it's to tell Rabbit, what do I need, so that he doesn't have to guess about what is going on with Mouse, so that he can care for him better, they form this going back to the theme, this unusual friendship on this rogue planet. So we go back to our theme. And if we're thinking about it power-wise, these two are sort of codependent. You know, Rabbit needs Mouse in order to have a purpose, and Mouse needs Rabbit in order to grow his food and take care of him. And so when Pal TV pulls him off the planet, this disrupts that partnership or pairing or unusual friendship and that world gets sort of set into an imbalance. And the dynamic in trying to convince Paul Tivi that he should send him back, it sort of shifts as the story's going along. Because at first he doesn't seem to care, but then as he continues to tell that story, he begins to, you know, get invested in the possibility of this mouse, of this super intelligent mouse. And of course, it's a curiosity. And he has cause to doubt it, but he also has cause to believe it because there's an android in front of him that's clearly outside the normal scope of what he would expect from an android. And as the story goes along, it seems more and more believable. So it would seem that his motivation in going down is to sort of play out the end of this investigation to solve the mystery of why this robot is behaving in such a strange way and that would sort of close the loop on that mystery subplot. Say, okay, aha, this robot was acting strangely because he cares about this mouse. Let's go down and see, and then I can make a decision, an informed decision about what I will do as the top person in this power structure, this relationship. And of course, he brings a strike bot with him to both symbolize and signify that he's still in the dominant position, but also to instantiate it in the Cersei Lannister sense. Power is power. This is my strike bot. What, what happens down there on that planet is still under my purview. And he seems to think that he's going down there to decide whether he's going to leave Robot down there with the mouse or just take him with him. Because, you know, why leave a perfectly good robot on a rogue planet where it can't ever be used for any useful human purpose? And who knows what he's going to do? I don't think he knows what he's going to do at that point. And I don't think he understands what he's really going to encounter down there until he does. So the mouse appears and it's not insignificant that this happens in the setting where all of these mysterious dark technologies were once investigated. And of course, what do all of those mysterious dark technologies represent but power? It's sort of ambiguous in the story exactly the, the nature of how dark these technologies are. But it's pretty explicit in terms of 
these are really dangerous and powerful tools and technological innovations that have been lost to humanity. And they're really bad because even the Trask wouldn't use them. But they're here and they're around. And oh yeah, Robot knows about all of them. And he's got this tiny little mouse that he cares about more than anything else in the universe. And then he just hands it to Paul Tivy. And Paul Tivy was not expecting what happened when the mouse goes in his hand. It's sort of like the ring of power going on his hand. He's holding this cute little defenseless creature. And you see episode, I think it's 35 or less than 35 on empathy markers. We have the most innocent little thing in the universe. It's tiny, it's cute, it is defenseless and helpless. He's also endearing. It's like, let's, uh, let's watch sports together. Let's hang out, man. I'm a little mouse. Like, hi, be my friend. Hi, rabbit. And so there's that balance on one hand. And then on the other hand, it's like, now that I've got this thing and I've got my strike bot over there, I can put this thing in my pocket and make this robot develop all of these dark technologies that can set the power hierarchy right according to what I feel is right. And those initial resentments that may seem like, oh, this is too much detail in the early part of the story. And maybe they are, who knows, right? Um, but those initial details set up this scenario where when that mouse drops into Paul Tivy Moran's hands, the reader understands this guy has a grudge. He's got a big grudge. He's got a problem with everything that's going on in his life and he's got every reason when he feels that feeling of, oh man, I have the ring of power on my hand now. What am I going to do about it? There's every reason to think that he has all the temptation that a human being could have. And what are you going to do about it? And that's the story, that moment. So, the resolution. And Mary Laura Ryan talks about this in her amazing book, Narrative is Virtual Reality, as what the sort of ideal window in terms of a resolution is a binary choice between sort of success or failure, yes or no, up or down, black or white, whatever it is, you really get to those two opposing options. And really for Paul Tevi Moran, it's I take this mouse, put it in my pocket, and make Rabbit my uh, servant in all of the things that I want to do to set the power hierarchy right using these tools in this illicit bunker. Or I take this little mouse, I hand it back to his friend, and I go on my way. And of course, that's what he does. And he has a reason for this. Uh, we find out when the little mouse calls Robot his brother, which gets him thinking, oh, what type of person do I become? Maybe if I give in to that feeling, or maybe he just has another feeling about his own brother. and says, no, nah, that intoxicating power thing is not congruent with maybe what my brother would think of me or maybe it's just simply like this is wrong that would be wrong it's not explicit in the text okay so then we have our plot resolved in a little denouement with his brother uh, back on his moon that sort of lets you know or leaves open the possibility that he might revisit this question it's not totally closed but it's pretty closed because he puts it in the hand of his brother and he says something that cues the reader to understand that he cares about the good and he would definitely prefer not to become a servant to that essentially evil feeling that he knows is like about as dark as it comes, but as powerful as it comes. Okay, so all of that in that single power structure, and here's the big surprise, the reveal. What I love about this story the most I did not think it was about power until I was editing the audio for the YouTube channel. I didn't even realize it. I thought this story was a mystery, or a mystery and a goal. And the mystery, of course, was that struct that substructure that I talked about earlier of why is this robot acting so funny? And I initially, when I started writing this story, I thought that the resolution or really the climax of the story was going to be robot and mouse being reunited. Like, aha, I talked this guy into, because of course his, his plot, robot's plot, is a goal plot. His goal is, I'm stuck here. 
I need to convince this guy to let me go back because I have one thing that I care about and I need to be reunited with him. That's my goal. So for me, when I started writing this story, I understood those two structures were the story, the mystery and the goal. And subconsciously or the muse or whatever it was told me that, and really all of this comes down to the narrative posture. Who is telling this story and why is this story being told from the viewpoint that it is? If we go to, you know, our, our lessons on, on the narrator, we have this extra diegetic narrator who's focalizing the story through Paltevi Moran. Why that position? And initially I thought that would be somebody who would investigate this mystery of this robot and then the robot could tell the story of why he's behaving in such a funny manner and then oh great and of course helpless little mouse and they're reunited and it's really emotional and oh what a great ending yeah no that was not the story at all and i didn't even realize it until i had finished the story and even when i had finished the story i didn't even realize what the story was about i spend so much time editing audio afterward it's almost like post-production in a movie. You have a movie and you make the movie and you or you write the movie and you draw out the storyboard and then you shoot the movie and you end up shooting a whole bunch of scenes that are going to get cut out and then you have the post-production where they put in special effects and all that stuff. So for me, the, my version of that is I write the story on my computer. I'll do a, a read-through where I read it with my eyes and of course I edit as I go along. I always listen to it a couple times. I'll listen to the computer read it to me, and then I'll listen to my Kindle read it to me, and then I will read it myself for the audio for the YouTube channel. And then, of course, because you make mistakes when you're reading, I usually end up with like three times as much audio as actually will make it onto the channel. The three times the amount of raw audio that makes it onto the channel. And then I edit it down and edit it down until it has the best possible reading that I can put out in a week and sometime in the process of editing this I realized oh my god this story was totally about power and I didn't even know it uh, but it is so this sort of goes back to the framing of the very first lesson on the channel the Kim's and the David like how much do you plan versus how much does that inspiration happen and take you away with it and in some ways, this is good for me because my instinct would be to be more of a planner, but to be forced to write a story every week, you know, it's self-imposed, but I kind of feel an obligation to have the story out every week. And that really forces me to trust that instinct. And I guess this also would go to the end lesson in the epilogues about what the intention of the mechanics lessons are that when you have a strong ingrained sense of how stories should be structured that when your instincts take over they take over in a good way and i guess this is my best example of this that i know about because i strongly feel that this story is much better being about paul tivy and his decision in that moment to set the imbalances in the power structure right using the dark tools that are at his fingertips or to, as he says, become more comfortable. You know, when he's talking to his brother, he talks about, yeah, sometimes the universe sucks, but it's better to be the person cleaning up the, the wrecked spaceship than to be the person in the spaceship. And then maybe implied in there would be the person causing that destruction, the person at the root of that destruction, which is what he would have become had he put the little mouse in his pocket and said, Robot, you're going to work for me, and we're going to do some dark shit. Okay, so that's Mouse. All right, my voice is starting to go, so I'm going to go. Thanks for hanging in there with me on this one. And I have one more planned in the coming weeks to talk about a story, The Rings of Floriston, because somebody asked me to talk about a love story. And so we'll talk about how a love story is structured using our one structure. It's actually two, but we'll get into that next time when we talk about the rings of Floriston. Thanks for listening to me ramble about Mouse. Uh, let me know if you have any questions or thoughts in the comments. Appreciate you stopping by and we'll see you next time.